I'm going to kick us off. All right. So with respect to time, thank you all for joining. Uh, my name is Cal, otherwise Eric, it's my real name. And this is DEFCON 864. And today we're joined by Barry, who's going to go through DevSecOps with GetLab. So I'm looking forward to, to hearing this talk. Now the normal format, I see some new faces here, is we normally have a presentation segment up front that can be anywhere from five minutes to 25 minutes. I think you requested three hours, and we had to cut you back. To just that 15 to 25 minute spot. So, That's typically how it goes. From there. Uh, but he does have three hours of content. He's just going to get through it really fast. He's just going to talk very fast. Yep. 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 That's why we're recording. Uh, so after that segment, uh, there is some time for Q&A. Uh, but once that goes through, it's after that we go through and do introductions. Uh, you can use your real name. You cannot use your real name. You can admit to give any name at all. It's your choice. Uh, and then our, our core uh, rules at DEF CON 864, they are on our website, dc864.org, but the, the core tenet of it is, is just to be a decent human, to treat others as decent humans. So that this is showing respect and being respectful. Uh, with that said, after the introductions, and we're all still remaining respectful, uh, we do an open project time. So if anyone has anything that they are currently working on or interested in, you're, you can have the, the floor for about five minutes to go through what you're working on. And then after that, we kind of break into villages. Um, I think tonight we're not really prepared to go into villages of red team, blue team. So it'll just be networking, communication, that kind of thing. And then the after party after here, where we'll meet at Bar Margaret for dinner. So optional, but those that have the time and want to join in, you're more than welcome to. And with that, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. So are we actually broadcasting? Yes. All right. So if, if you're listening and you see the, the URL at the top of the slides right there, uh, if you have questions as I'm going through this, feel free to click on that link. If you submit a question, anybody else who's on the link will be able to upvote your question. I'll be able to see it right here, and I can feature it on the slide uh, while, we, while we discuss it. But I'm um, here tonight to talk about DevSecOps with, uh, with GitLab. This is the first time I've ever given this presentation, so bear with me. Um, my name is Barry Jones, and uh, I, uh, I went to Clemson. I've been a polyglot developer and a DevSecOps practitioner for about the last 20 years or so. Uh, I'm cur currently a fractional CTO consultant with my company, Brightball. I'm also the organizer of the Carolina Code Conference. DC864 holds a very special place in my heart because it's the first meetup that I ever went to to advertise the conference after I took it over. So thank you all for having me here for that. That was a big help. Um, and I'm also a GitLab professional services engineer um, with uh, just officially certified so I can basically teach GitLab training classes. Um, and I do that through a company called Seek Quality that uh, originally started out of Charleston but has, uh, has moved up here, teaches all over. Classes can be in person or remote. Uh, and they are a, one of the very few GitLab certified uh, training partners and professional services partner. So what is GitLab? Show of hands. Who knows what GitLab is? Who wants to give me an answer to that one? I'll put you on the spot. Oh, man. You didn't come to my presentation. <laughs> um, Git server, help manage uh, version history, help unify everything, yep. automatic builds. Uh, the GitHub generic brand? <laughs> <laughs> That's brutal right That's there. A a anybody else want, want to give some bad answers to that one? <laughs> yeah. All right. Okay. So GitLab is the leading DevSecOps platform, according to Gartner, at least. Pulling back up the URL that worked before. Is GitLab different from GitHub? I have a question. See, people are participating. All right, yes, GitLab is different from GitHub. We will get into a lot of the details of that as we go. They do, uh, they do have certain commonalities and overlaps, but we, can, we will talk about a lot of differences throughout that, so I'm not going to try to answer all that up front. But there, but thank you for helping me demonstrate the audience tools. So yeah, and just so we went back real quick, Assuming this actually works now. There we go. Okay, so there was stuff I was talking about when that wasn't moving in front of you. Anywho. All right, so what is DevSecOps? Any ideas? The idea and the concept of coding in a secure way as you develop your product so that you're, as the methodology continues, you're making sure you're not to have iterative issues come up. That is an excellent answer. Um, I, I would go with that normally. For the most part, to simplify it, uh, I just like to call it security in your DevOps pipeline. Plus, it makes for a fun visual analogy because you put the sec right in the middle of the dev and the op, so it's literally in your pipeline. Yep, see. <laughs> 
So this is a, a, a picture of the, the stages of, uh, that you can go through with GitLab. GitLab's goal is to have a single pane of, uh, a single pane of glass tool for managing your entire uh, development process, all the way from management and planning to, uh, to verification, builds, deploys, security scans, uh, automated releases, and then even monitoring uh, once, it's, once it's in production the whole way. It wants, to, it wants you to give you one tool to cover everything. Uh, how it typically differs from GitHub is that GitHub, yes, they both have the version control piece. GitHub will have some functionality that, uh, that will try to mirror some of this, but for the most part, with GitHub, your expectation is that you're going to be plugging in a lot of other peripheral software into what you're doing, whereas GitLab's trying to give you a best of breed. It's not always best of breed to start with, but eventually they're trying to give you a best of breed in the entire process the whole way down so you can manage it centrally, so you can have your users track centrally without having to manage all these other different pieces of software together. But you can still plug into all of them. Plus, uh, GitLab also is, uh, has the um, open core model where a lot of it's open source, you can pull it down and run it on your own infrastructure if you want, and they really invest in making it easy to deploy uh, in any environment that you want. So for when it comes from a security standpoint, companies that want to have complete control over their, over their code, for the most part, will end up using instances of GitLab internally within their own networks, like Lockheed Martin and a lot of other various, uh, other various government contractors will end up using GitLab quite heavily because of that. But this middle piece over here, this is sort of your, your standard development flow, where you know after you've after you've planned, you've been assigned an issue here. Issues assigned, you create a merge request, you go through the process over here of, of a developer writing some code, iterating it up, pushing it back up to the system. Once the code is pushed up to GitLab on whatever Git branch it's on, the, um, the testing and the automation will begin. It'll start running whatever test you have set up, and you can code you can code these, you can customize them. You can make the process whatever makes sense for your company. And as long as those tests don't pass, you, your developer is going to keep on working until they do because you're not going to let anything go through that doesn't pass all the tests. This is how you build in automatic quality because you can't manually check every single thing every single time. We would never get anything done. Um, once that's all done, you can you know, fire off a review app to, to spin up an instance of the system to, to test it manually and then merge everything back in to the, to the master branch and release it and deploy it. That's just your general DevOps workflow. Nothing you all probably have not seen before. Now the idea is to have automation for every commit, just some commits, or just merge requests, really whatever your process is. Every, every company's process is different. There is no one right way to do this. People have different strategies on managing Git branching, on managing their entire development workflow. Everything is going to be different for every company. I, I did this training one time for a company who was using uh, embedded devices that needed to run tests from MATLAB in certain situations. You can adapt to that by setting up a, a very specific custom runner that only works on one machine on certain branches that can pull down and have a license copy of MATLAB to run the coding. You can set all that stuff up. Anything that you need to do in your development process can be done in an automatic way. So this is a picture of a development pipeline. This is actually from the, uh, from the GitLab project on GitLab.com which they publish openly. You can go visit this right now if you want to. Uh, it's the, uh, they have all of the builds for the entire GitLab project. Public facing, you can look at this incredibly, every single line that you see here in every one of these columns, the, the columns are stages, the line items as you go down are different jobs that are pulled in. And you can see the status of each of those jobs. Every one of these can run in parallel. They can have dependencies. Uh, to run one after the other. By default, each stage has to finish before it moves to the next stage. But you can customize it, optimize it however you need to. All of that finishes in about 12 minutes. Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> but uh, then they have other views where you can actually look at the dependencies that are on there. There's so much to, to do. I know you can't really see a lot of this from here, but um, just to give you an idea of, of how much can be involved. Because a lot of times when you're first starting out, your whole thought is, okay, I'm going to push it up. I'm going to have one thing runs some tests and I might string a couple other things in if it fails, move on. And the more you get involved, the more developers you have involved, the more mature your process becomes, the more you're going to start isolating, separating, moving pieces out so that you can do them in parallel and so that you can track different things in different ways. Um, and they have type, you know, I talked about uh, job runners. 
So job runners are basically just what runs each one of these jobs. And so there are shared runners that are hosted on GitLab where you can pay per minute for them, depending on what your plan is, but you can also run them on your own equipment. I've seen dev teams, everybody sets up a runner on their own machine. So that if you have five developers, you have five machines running your tests. And, up, and accordingly for your project, you've got a lot of horsepower to get through your, your test faster because iteration, faster iteration, being able to move quicker is the name of the game. Um, but you can do, you can make your own custom runners. Uh, you can have stuff deployed to Kubernetes and run instances of, uh, of your jobs there. You can have uh, a runner that SSHs into other machines and runs things from there if you need to, or you can just do it from your basic shell. You can do it just about any way that you want. Um, and you get the flexibility for, for pretty much any bit of tooling that you need. So the secure stage, this is a, just a little graphic that uh, GitLab provides. It's basically just this circular process of create, verify, plan, package, release, configure, start again, over and over and over, repeating over and over and over as you continue iterating and building and developing your software. The secure, the secure piece is about running scans, reporting on them, and then correcting those issues based on your compliance requirements and your own personal strong opinions about what actually does need to be done. So again, we're back in this all stages together. It shows you the stages right here at the top, sort of your general hypothetical DevSecOps stages. We're gonna be focused on the secure stage right here. So, of the available security features that you're going to find uh, within GitLab and in a general DevSecOps pipeline, this is also something where I'm going to tell you one of the major areas where, this, uh, where GitLab differs from GitHub is that GitHub, this is being recorded, a very wealthy company that owns a version control product um, <laughs> would typically uh, tell you all of these features are available for about 10 grand a month uh, if you wanted to sign up for their enterprise plan. GitLab will tell you all these features are available and by the way here's all the open source tools we use to run it if you wanted to set them up yourself. They're very transparent about everything and as I cover every single one of these features that are, that are on here, I think every single one of these features, I should be able to point you to whatever open source tooling is running on it behind the scenes which is pretty slick. And so we'll, we'll be talking about static application security testing uh, which is basically just uh, just like source code, an uh, source code analysis tools, um, dynamic application security testing, uh, crawlers, things that you would aim at a website and have it actually crawl and, f and try to figure out if it can hack its way into the application. Um, dependency testing, looking at your, your, your third party dependencies, things you might be pulling in from other libraries, find out if there's any issues. Secret detection, did some moron on your team, like me, uh, commit some critical token or key or API key into the Git repository and now you have to go and invalidate it and revert it and clear it out because it's no longer a secure key anymore. Um, infrastructure is code scanning. If we're talking about Ansible, Terraform, uh, AWS, CloudFormation stuff, you can actually scan that and look for vulnerabilities in your own uh, network configurations, which is pretty slick. Uh, container scanning, if you want to scan your Docker containers for the various dependencies that are in there and see if you've got anything that's outdated. Uh, license scanning. Maybe you have policies that you're not allowed to use GPL code at your company. This will find it in the very in the dependencies of your projects and let you manage it at a high level across the organization. And you can actually set approve or disapprove rules that will block people from accidentally including this code in your code base. Go ahead. Will it find if someone maybe there's a, a dependent software that has a license agreement that you don't want? Can you use it to help find like if someone's brought in a package that uses terms that go against what your terms are? Well, it, so it'll look for licenses that it knows about. Like it'll look for things like MIT, GPL. <coughs> if it sees an unknown license, uh, I'm not actually sure what it does. I haven't come across that before. But for the most part, you're you're assuming that you know, there's there's the list of, of common open source licenses that yeah. are out there. It'll look for it'll look for those. But could you flag one and say if I see this license type come into my project? We need to do something. Yep. So, uh, so what it'll do, and we're gonna, we'll cover that in a little bit, but what it'll basically do is it lets you uh, look for the licenses. You can set certain licenses to be automatically approved. Anything new, you'll have to review and decide whether it's approved or not. And you can also automatically deny certain licenses uh, to, to simplify things that way. Um, you get into fuzz testing. Fuzz testing is where you're just trying to test what you don't know. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit at the end. But you basically are just having it shove in random data to see if it can break things. Uh, and the last thing, of course, is you know, vulnerability management. Where do you track all of this stuff as you're finding it? So um, let's talk through them a little bit. Static application security testing. Uh, so this is 
essentially source code scanners. And these scanners exist for just about every language that's out there. Um, like in, I do a lot of Ruby code, there's a popular Ruby source code scanner called Breakman. Uh, and you'll find various versions of these. They actually look through the source code to find vulnerabilities and they will flag them and they will uh, sort them and rate them as a, a criticality level so that you can decide anything that's, you know, low, I'm probably just going to going to let those run. I'm not going to stop the build for it. But anything that's that's critical, I'm just going to say, okay, we're, we're definitely not letting any of this stuff go through. This has to be dealt with before you can advance the project any further. Um, this link right here, I'm not going to pull it up right now, but they've got scanners available for, they have specific scanners available for almost every language and framework that are out there. GitLab has this, uh, this SAST template, makes it easy for you to set up. Um, sorry. They've got, a, they've got a template that you can do to just pull the SAST scanners into your project and it will detect what languages you're running. It'll turn on all the scanners that it thinks not, that you need based on what you have. If it sees Ruby code, it'll turn on Breakman. If it sees JavaScript code, it'll turn on a scanner for that. Um, it'll pull in all the various scanners, have them run as part of your pipeline, and then collect all of the feedback from all those different scanners and put them in a central place where you, the security team, can review it and decide if this is something that needs to be dealt with. And then you can assign issues to the developers right from there. And if you're on the enterprise plan, you can even get videos that tell you how to fix that vulnerability, which is pretty cool. And so that's just a little look at you know what it what might look like in terms of getting a a high level vulnerability or kind of a list of uh, what's new and what was fixed based on the commit because everything in this is version controlled. So you get multiple views of this as well. So you get the security dashboard. So the security dashboard is at the group level. The way that projects work within GitLab is you have individual projects and then you have groups. Groups can go up to 20 levels deep in a tree. And so if you have a security dashboard at a group level that is over a bunch of projects and subgroups, a security dashboard is going to roll up everything under that into that dashboard for you. And you can manage all of the vulnerabilities discovered across all of those projects in one place. There's another um, feature that, uh, that GitLab has that you can turn on called Auto DevOps. And so you can go in and configure a GitLab CI file if you want to do every little detail of your configuration that you want. But if you want to start out quicker, you can also start with the Auto DevOps file. And what it'll do is it'll just look at the code and try to turn on as much stuff as it can based on what it already sees. If it sees that you're using certain types of testing libraries, it'll turn on the scans for that. It'll look, it'll look at it. So across the board, by default, you can have Auto DevOps set up and just turn this stuff on for all of the projects and just see what happens, which is pretty slick. Um, you also get it at the project level. So every time there's a merge request, which is, you know, when a developer has code on a branch, um, I assume you're familiar with merge requests or pull requests, basically the same thing, but the idea is, you know, developer's been working on code on a branch, he's ready to say, okay, I think this is ready to move in, so we have a merge request. The merge request is a place that people can look at it, they can view all the changes that the developer made to that code, uh, they can comment on them, they can review them, they can approve them, they can see the results of all the scans in one place. Um, and including the security scans. The security scans will show up on their own tab and you can see, as we saw on the previous slide, the, the new and fixed. You can see kind of what is the diff for this, uh, for this merge request based on the results that we've seen. Uh, and you also have a, a project level, not just, on the, not just on the specific merge request, but on the project level for, um, for everything as well. You'll have a security tab there where you can review all of it. From that security tab, you will get this type of picture right here of, of what the security scans look like. You'll get an idea of what the vulnerability is. You'll get a description of it. You'll find out where it is, the specific file, the unique identifiers that are in there, uh, confidence levels, security rating, and all that, as well as links to learn more about what the vulnerability is right there. From there, you as a security team can manage these vulnerabilities. You can either uh, decide to just cancel it, we're going to come back and discuss it later. You can decide to dismiss it, and if you're going to dismiss it, you add a comment of why you're dismissing this vulnerability as something that's no longer a problem. Or you can go and create an issue that will go on the project so the development team will have to resolve this issue. Uh, and they can you know, either they can assign it or you can assign it. But everything within everything within GitLab comes down to issues. Ish, you know, when you're doing project planning, every item and every task, every store, or whatever, they're all called an issue in GitLab. And so you create issues, assign them. Somebody might work on it at some point in the future.
If I own GitLab Ultimate for one user, Hi, anonymous. If I own GitLab Ultimate for one user, can I offer DAST SAS assessments to clients? Uh, I don't see why not. You would just have to pull the entire code base into your repository. So as long as your client was okay with that, um, then yeah, you should be able to. All right. I've got another question on there that I'm going to address later. All right. So the scanners, as we talked about, are open source. Uh, if you've ever, I mean, quick show of hands, who in here has run a security scanner before? Okay. Um, who's had to run security scanners as part of compliance initiatives? Who has had a single place where all of the output from all of your scanners went back to that you could easily review it? All right, then. That's good. Was it GitHub? Who's GitHub? That's what I like to hear. <laughs> nice. My, my, my people. So the, the scanners are open source, but there's nothing that prevents you from adding new scanners. The only thing that makes these reports consumable by the security dashboard is that they output an artifact that is a JSON, a JSON file uh, with the results that meets a certain format so that it can be ingested. So if you have another scanner that's out there, if you've got What's a really popular scanner right now? Tenable. Tenable? Okay. Nessus? We'll go, we'll go with Nessus. So let's assume, assume you want to include Nessus. You just take the output of that report, you write something that will convert it to, to the JSON, uh, JSON format that's necessary, and then boom, you can pl plug those results right in with, uh, with the rest of your, your GitLab results in one place. It's pretty straightforward to add. If you want to turn on the static application security scanners, in your uh, in your GitLab CI YAML file in the project, you would literally just add that those two lines, and it's centered so you can't really see, but um, that template should be indented slightly into include the includes just super centered, and it's ridiculous. But yeah, you would basically just add that uh, add that template line in, and it turns on all the security scanners for you. That's that's all you have to do, and you can pass variables, you can configure specific factors of it if you want to. Um, you can also include each scanner manually if you want to. But this is a uh, GitLab makes it about as easy as it can to include those pieces. Do, do you need to specify the language that you're using, or it just picks it up? Not with that. It'll just pick it up. It'll it'll look at your code because it's right there in your repository, and uh, it'll it'll go through and tell you, okay, well I can see you've got JavaScript and Ruby in this, so we're going to turn on all the JavaScript and Ruby scanners. Um, there's one. Uh, there's a, a broad scanner called SemGrep that it uses a lot of too. That applies to multiple languages and a lot of times it will just turn that one on in addition to it so you may even get some double scans but uh, it'll set each one of them up as its own job and compile the results as well so uh, dynamic application security testing so this is for your actual scanners if you were going to aim it at a website and have it crawl the website and try to and and try to to uh, to hack into it um, the GitLab dynamic application security testing uses the OWASP ZA proxy anybody here use that before all right, and so, of course, you're not scanning your live site. You're scanning test and development sites. One of the things that's really cool about this, though, is because we're building into your, to your existing workflow, um, you know, a lot of times in, in early dev environments, you'll end up having developers working on their local computers, deploying to a staging server that they're all waiting for turns on to test things on and then it goes to uh, and then it gets deployed to the production server after it's after it's passed its testing one of the things that GitLab strongly encourages you to do is to hook into kubernetes and one of the reasons for that is because if if you're not using kubernetes in production that's fine you don't need to i'm not an advocate for using kubernetes in production it's a, it's a whole lot to manage but because you're sharing the resources of a quick show of hands. Who, who's who here knows Kubernetes? Okay, Kubernetes is basically just a way that you can deploy a bunch of a bunch of containers uh, to a to a single machine or cluster of machines. And in a production environment, I've never really thought it made that much sense in the first place because in production you're usually concerned about scaling concerns and you want those resources to be dedicated to your application anyway. So it's kind of a pain that way. But in a non-production environment like this. Kubernetes gives you the ability to say, I'm going to spin up a new copy of the entire application with its own database and its own resources for every single branch before it gets tested. 
And so when you can do that, that's what, when, uh, when GitLab talks about the review app, that's what it's talking about doing. What it'll do is it'll let you deploy your branch after it's passed all of its other tests. It'll deploy an entire clone of the application. It'll give it its own unique URL that you can then go and log into and visit to mess around with. One of the other side effects of having your own unique URL for the branch is that you can point a scanner to that unique instance of it as well. So you can run a full crawler on it before you mer even merge it back in and detect anything new that came up from that branch, which is pretty cool. So DAST configuration is pretty simple as well. Include template in your, in your configuration file, gets added in, and then you need to pass in specific variables. And so if you were going to pass in example.com as the website, you might need to pass in a username or a password depending on what the setup was for it. Um, there's a whole set of variables and everything that you can do to, to tweak this. Anything that you could need to do with, um, with the A proxy, you should be able to do with this. But the, uh, <clears throat> and the, the URL that's on there, that's a hard-coded URL. There are also variables that you would be able to get from whatever GitLab spun up as the unique URL for your site, the unique subdomain that it put it on. Um, the findings from those scans, just like the SAS scans, will be available on that same central security dashboard, so you can look at all of the results all in one place. Uh, you'd be able to run these scanners automatically within your pipelines, and then you could review them. Then if you needed to get in and really manually dig into something, you could. Um, and, of course, just like with anything else, you can add any scanner that you like. There's nothing limiting you to only the tools they have available here. Dependency scanning. So this is a fun one. So when you're checking on the various third-party dependencies that are available in your application, uh, how many people here have used Node.js? Okay. Um, anytime that you pull, um, pull a package from NPM, it's pulling that package, it's pulling the dependency on that package, it's pulling that package's dependency. There's a whole dependency tree involved in everything. Uh, and every single one of those has a version number on it, and every version number that's out there has CVEs that are tied to specific version numbers. So the dependency scanners are not going and actually scanning all of the code for each of these dependencies. They're looking to see what version of each thing that you have, and they're comparing it against a library of known vulnerabilities that are out there. Same thing Dependabot does, if you've used Dependabot on that other site. Okay? But um, they're using, and as I said before, open source, they're using Gymnasium behind the scenes. It'll scan any language that, uh, that uh, Gymnasium does to look for any issues and dependencies in your, your application supply chain. Container scanning. So container scanning will end up using uh, scanners Trivi and Gripe, depending on what it thinks is the best fit. Again, open source scanners. There's nothing stopping you from just going and pulling these down yourself and running them yourself, uh, and even formatting the output so that it can be used in the security dashboard. But if you already have it available, there's no reason not to just turn it on. Uh, one of the biggest things with container scanning is it's probably one of the most overlooked vulnerability problems in the entire software development industry. As you get a container running, you get your code running, you deploy it, and then you don't touch the container again while vulnerabilities are coming out for packages that are installed on that container. You just forget about it because everything works. And it's completely overlooked in your, in your deployment process, in your security process. And those get stale, and they continue to age, and then eventually they get exploited. Container scans will actually look at the built images. They'll look at the packages that were pulled in within these containers to find what those vulnerabilities are. And it will also check into, into various libraries. Trivia will actually get you a lot of overlap sometimes with, uh, with issues that you find in your code base as well. It'll, it'll do a little, a little bit of everything. It's a very big scanner, Trivia. <clears throat> so another piece of this are the package and container registries. These aren't security scanners. But with the package and container registries, you get to continue to protect yourself against the supply chain attacks that you would get with dependency scanners and with, um, and with your container scanners. Because rather than, you know, how often does, does NPM go down? Pretty frequently, right? We've all heard lots of stories about either a, a library that was pulled from NPM for some reason or a library that was compromised in one of the other package repositories. It happens all the time. They're called supply chain attacks. So people try to go after something that's going to be included in your code base that they can then exploit your code base. Well, one of the perks of this is that you can set up a proxy through GitLab to point GitLab for your project at NPM or at 
Ruby gems or whatever other library that you're using. And what it'll do is it will store the versions of those repositories of those libraries that you're using within your code base on GitLab. Your application points to there. When you need to deploy code, when you need to run instances, when you need to deploy tests, uh, testing situations, <clears throat> when, you, uh, when you need to build new containers to run your tests on, I mean, um, it will pull from GitLab and not hit NPM over and over and over and over. And that way, if your version is secure and it's compromised upstream, or somebody deletes a library that the rest of your code needs, everything still works for you. You don't get disrupted because one of those things go down. It's a business decision and it's a supply chain decision. Uh, similar for, for container images. You, know, you can go put everything on Docker Hub if you want to, or you can put it where everything else on your application lives and not have to worry about an outside dependency on a service negatively impacting how your operation works from a day-to-day -day basis. Infrastructure as code scanning. So anybody use any of the tools that are up here, Ansible, CloudFormation, Azure, Docker files, Google Deployment Manager, Kubernetes, uh, OpenAPI, or Terraform. Awesome. Doing things the right way. So infrastructure is code. It's code. You're version controlling it the same way as you're version controlling everything else. And that code can be looked at to see if there are problems. And it will. The scanner called KICS, Kix. Again, open source. You can run this right now. Uh, and it will go through and it will scan to let you know about vulnerability issues that it sees and the configuration that you've got set up in your own infrastructure as code. And it will also tell you if those things have, have been resolved. Also, I haven't mentioned this, but with all of these various scanners that are set up, if you're using the ones that are, you can, run, you can set them up and manage them yourself within your own projects if you want to. If you are using the, the GitLab ones, they update them constantly for you so that you don't have to. Some of them update daily, some of them update every 30 days, um, but for the most part, it takes that piece of it off of, your, uh, off of your plate in terms of something that you have to manage if you've got all these different scanners running. Secret detection. So this looks for credentials in your Git repository. It will also let you prune them from your Git repository. So if you decided to store a username and password and commit it to your Git repository and then push it up and share it with your team, that username and password has to be revoked because it's now been compromised by every single person that has access to the Git repo uh, or will ever have access to the Git repo. You can't do that. Um, but uh, with GitLab, you can also automatically respond to those leaked secrets. You can trigger it to revoke the secrets automatically. You can tell it to contact and notify the third party, um, a third party if it sees any credentials in a public repository as well. If you're utilizing a third party tool and it finds it, it will actually notify the party to invalidate that token as well and to flag it as potential compromise. Uh, behind the scenes, this is using Git leaks. So open source tool written in Go. And this isn't a, a GitLab thing. This is just a, I've implemented Git leaks before. And uh, I would strongly recommend that every single project use this. Development teams should be setting up Git leaks to run as a pre-commit hook on their local machines so that it never actually makes it into the Git history. Um, and this is, a, this is a pretty easy thing to do. There's another, so Git leaks is written in Go, which you know, makes it portable essentially. And there's another library called Left Hook. It's written in Go to give you, um, to give you portable Git hooks, pre-commit hooks. Make it easy to, uh, for you to configure it one time and then install it across projects in multiple languages so that you can trigger these things to run uh, as a pre-commit hook in Git to make sure those things never get in. Because, you know, once it's in, it's in, but Git leaks will also let you purge things from the entire history. And just in, if you've ever had to deal with this, you will also know there, there is a configuration file. You can tell it to ignore certain areas. There's a very popular library for, uh, for API testing within uh, Ruby called VCR that records the entire payload uh, to and from so that you can use it in tests and that payload will have API keys in it. Git leaks will detect that, so you have to tell it to ignore the VCR directory, essentially, for all of your, your testing keys and stuff. And so you're able to deal with all of them from there. License detection that we talked about earlier. This is kind of what your, uh, what your license configuration will look like. I know it's a little bit hard to see up there. Probably should have blown that up a little bit. <laughs> but um, but as, it, as it discovers licenses, it's, it's a similar thing to, to everything else that's on here. You can 
find your, your MIT, your Apache, GPL, whatever else. Organization gets to decide what it approves of, what it does not approve of, uh, and anything new that it hasn't made a decision about yet so that it can be reviewed. Um, but uh, let your organization maintain its, its licensing requirements so that it doesn't do anything accidental. And uh, last one, fuzz testing. Fuzz testing is fun. So you have libraries for fuzz testing that are written in just about uh, every language that's out there. All, and with fuzz testing, you are not testing your entire application. You are testing a function. You have a function that is critical to your application. You set up a fuzz tester to test that one function, and it will insert all of the random data that it possibly can and try to trigger an exception or something that, that is unexpected for it to happen. Every time it fit, and it's, it's generating random data. No two runs of this will, will give you the same stuff. So you could run it one time and get, an, and get a bunch of errors and run it another time and not get them at all because it might try something different. And this is just because, uh, you know, I listened to a presentation from a guy named Robert Roskam at, a, at the, the Hat Greenville Nights the other day, and he was talking about testing. And he said, uh, I think his line was, he was giving a talk about testing, and his line was, 100% testing is not enough. Or 100% code coverage is not enough. Because you can test every line, but that doesn't mean you tested every line well. Uh, and so what he means by that is that if you've got something that is expecting a certain payload and there's a limit on the size of the payload, what happens if you, if you put the payload in a little bit too big? If you've, ever dealt with, if you've ever heard about hacked game servers when they're sending, in, when they're sending data back, if you have you know, zero coins in a game and you send it, uh, you know, now I have negative one coins, it'll flip if it's an unsigned int. Instead of having negative one coins, you'll go to whatever the maximum value of that int was. It's a very common vulnerability that's been around for years. And so what this does is it lets you take that function and the code will just generate a bunch of random data to, to go to it and it'll see what you're not prepared to handle. And then it will capture that in what it calls a corpus. Every single thing that it finds that fails it will store in a corpus file so that you can use it in future tests. It's a good way of hardening something, especially if it's a, if it's a critical function of your application. You do have to set these up manually. They're a little bit uh, tough to deal with. In some cases, they're very, very worth it though. And there's also API fuzzers that you can aim them at API endpoints. Um, again, all the language-specific fuzzers are open source. And there's another one. It's an AFL uh, a fuzzer called uh, AFL. I think it's actually called American Fuzzer Language is what AFL stands for. I'm not positive off the top of my head. But it is a security-focused fuzzer that actually works across multiple languages. And so both of those will be used if you needed to use fuzzing. And so summing it up, the goal is that you want to scan everything often and automatically. You want to be able to review all of the issues from all of these different scanners, either among the team that's dealing with the project or as the security team who's over a bunch of projects so that you can identify what needs to be dealt with, what hasn't been dealt with, when it first appeared, how to resolve it, who should be resolving it, assigning issues out to get it dealt with, and then track and make sure that it's actually being dealt with. Because if you're in, if you're in a large organization that's got 100 projects, Managing everything in one place is going to be really, <laughs> it's going to be a big win. Uh, you will also, for compliance reasons, you need to be able to track that you have been running these scanners regularly. If you're as soon as you set up everything for SOC 2 Type 2, I mean you're you're representing. Okay, I've said these are the scanners that we're running on every deployment. Now we have to make sure we did, and we're also saying we're not letting anything in that was critical or high-level vulnerability. Well, Here's how we prove it. We've got the audit trail. Whenever they pull that random sample, you'll have the audit trail to go with it. Uh, and uh, again, you can use existing scanners or you can bring your own. And the idea here is that you know, if you've got, say, a bunch of pen testers, you want to make them earn it. Yeah. Run the scanners that are going to find everything they're going to find by default anyway, and then make them find something that you don't already know about. Thanks. Get lab training available from C Quality. If you ever want to visit C Quality. That's it. Thank you all for having me. Oh. Sorry. Let me blow that back up for you. Oh. There we go. Gotcha. All right. Okay. All right. Questions? I know you all asked a lot during the actual presentation, but any additional questions? I think there was one more on the thing that I forgot to address. So, sorry, uh, what, uh, can you ask her to ask her question in Discord real quick? Because I deleted it. <laughs> yeah, but up. What was it? Uh, if you have time, 
during this talk, the question, I hear the words continuous integration quite a bit. What is continuous security? How do you feel or how do you keep it continuous? Uh, continuous on, on any of it is basically just having it built into your process so that you're doing it all the time. Continuous integration, you're running merge requests constantly throughout your development process. Um, continuous education, continuous learning. You're doing reviews with your team to find out how things were going, how things can improve, what you can do better. Continuous security, it's just like this. You're constantly, you're not doing a once a year thing. You're constantly looking at security issues, finding out how they got there, trying to figure out how to improve so that it doesn't happen again and how you can resolve what's there and what you learn from it. Uh, and that's the, that's the key to all of it. You're just building into your process to continuously improve every single thing that you're doing. And you can put all the different labels that are on, that are on it, but uh, continuous deployment is kind of designed to count and to encompass all of it. And with continuous being in the site of your delivery process? Yes. Okay. Not like on a scheduled basis of like 24-7, you're just constantly cycling through these things? No, no, just, just in your workflow. Yeah, just, just, just in your workflow, in your process, how you okay. do things as a company, your, uh, your uh, software development life cycle, essentially. Yes? You can, you can set it up to not need any sort of manual For, for GitLab? Um, at what phase? You, you always have to manually review and manually merge the merge request. Uh, and you can, but you can set up to automate anything from the point that, uh, I mean, if, technically you could. You could, okay. you, you, no, I'm you, to it, so what, what you can do is you could set up a rule if you wanted to automatically deploy to, say, your production environment. You can set it up so that uh, your deployment workflow runs whenever a commit happens to the main branch of the application. Uh, and then within GitLab, you can make it so that no one can actually directly commit to the main branch of the application. That can only happen through a merge request that goes through your approval process. Uh, and so that way you kind of safeguard it. Once something goes through the approval process to get into the main branch, then you can have it kick off everything else from the deployment process there. And then and you can trigger it. You can actually have it trigger workflows in other projects as well. So if you have uh, I've, I've heard of people doing crazy things from having one project trigger builds in another project that pull up in like three other different things together into, into one. If, if you've got like a very separated front end development stack and a, and a back end development stack, but you want to deploy them all together, then they might kick off <laughs> things in each other's processes. Yeah. Something else here. Exactly. Exactly. And, and that's why I, my personal favorite thing about GitLab, whether we're talking about this or even the project management tools that are in it, it's really flexible. I mean, if, if there's any weird configuration that you can think of about how your company works or how a company that you've dealt with works before, they say, oh, not, we could never use any tool because we've got such a unique workflow. Because every, every single company's problems are, are special and unique, as we all know. Um, never happened before. Yeah. And there's, there is a way that you, uh, that you should be able to adapt the tooling that's here to the needs of that company, to its requirements, to its compliance requirements, to its deployment requirements, to its weird machine configuration requirements. If you've got something that needs to run on an old machine, if you can SSH to it, you can set something up that can SSH to it and, and uh, trigger like that, even if you can't get code to run on it directly. There's always a way. Yeah. I tried a bunch of SaaS tools, and one thing I struggle with is that the signal to noise ratio is just way off. Like, there'll be like a hundred issues, and only maybe one or two will be like really an issue, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and do you have any way of dealing with that, or is it just turning through the tests and, you know, marking them as yet? This isn't relevant. Yeah, so I mean, there's, there's definitely some, some areas where that'll come up. Uh, especially, you, you, you tell me if I'm on the right track here or not. Uh, do you see this with Node.js code that is only going to be compiling stuff on the back end that's never going to be exposed to anything that could be touched? Like, that's that's one that I get a lot of false positives on. I mean, it just depends on the tool. I have, tried, I have tried one tool, and like for every regular expression, it's like, well, there could be a, a, a denial of service here if this, if this, and it's like, yeah, there could be, but not with that particular regular expression. But it wasn't intelligent enough to really look at that regular expression. And so instead, it just gives a warning for every regular expression. 
Did and it, like that type of tool, I'm just like, this is useless. Did it call it low or high or? Um, yeah, I mean, I guess the, the and I guess that's another thing I struggle kind of with is that sometimes there'll be, yeah, I, I get people in my organization that will be like, this is related, this is high, this is mercy. I'm like, it's not even using it runtime. It's, it's a test of don't worry about it, it's fine. But like them seeing that high, but at the same time, there'll be something that they'll label as a medium. I'm like, well, I don't know. I mean, yeah, it's medium, but it's legit. I mean, it's a runtime dependency. It's, and so I, I guess the categorization they give to these CDEs, I don't, I, I feel like I'd still need to look through them, but then it's just this avalanche. Yeah. Um, well, the the CDEs, that. I think, is okay, but like, then you add to that, you know, the SAS tools that are just going to generate potential issues in the hundreds, and it's just I, I end up abandoning them. Well, so there's a there's a couple ways that you can treat it. One of the nice things that's on here is when you get the result in the security dashboard centrally, mm -hmm. and you get eyes on it, and you go, "This isn't really an issue." You get to dismiss and write yeah. a comment. This is not an issue because this, and it will remember that. Um, with the various SAS scanners that are out there. I can't speak to every SAS scanner that's out there. Um, I am very familiar with Breakman in Ruby. I've used it a ton. Yeah, Breakman. I've used Breakman. And so, and, and Breakman's you know really good about flexibility. You can you can tell it to, you can tell it what does and does not actually break the build. So you're getting the results, but it's not going to give and it's not going to give you an error result on the scan so that it won't fail the build. And you can say you know if it's high or critical, I want you to fail the build no matter what. If it's medium or low, I want to see it in the report so I can know when it appeared but I'm not necessarily going to act on it yet, but we'll look at it and we'll see if this is, if this is something we think is really an issue. Um, you can also tell it to ignore certain classes of vulnerabilities. Um, there are some, uh, some of them are, can be a little bit tough too if you get into, uh, if you get into wrappers, like it'll, like on a regular expression, if you've got something that's, that's, uh, that's uh, filtering the, the keyword, or the, filtering the variables that are going in that could, cause it to be an issue and it's not detecting that filter around it that's actually checking it uh, you know it might flag it but you might be able to go and say okay well, we're going to ignore this one because this is actually checking where it doesn't think we're checking and so just knowing that you've gone through and reviewed it and checked it the very first time that you run and if it hasn't been run before yes it's going to find a ton of stuff um, going through the high level stuff first is critical and what i do on all the projects especially when because there's a balance in every company, right? We all would love to just say, okay, we're just gonna stop the presses, fix all the security stuff, and then we're gonna get back to get back to work. But nobody in product development is ever gonna let that happen. Nobody who actually has to release things to customers is ever gonna let that happen because you still have to move product. You still have to get features out. You still have to make progress uh, or, or you're never gonna get anything done. But, um, but I mean, ultimately, you wanna at least address the highs and the criticals as quickly as possible whether you've actually resolved them or whether you've looked into them and just said this isn't a problem so we're gonna we're gonna line item and out um, and then go from there I mean you it, it's project management just like anything else you have to decide what makes sense to start with what you can get through and what you can't and ultimately it'll be up to the organization to kind of make a decision on it like you can say this is our recommendation of what we think we need to be doing here we want the scanners to run because they are finding legitimate things and once they start finding legitimate things, once you get it cleared out, then the, on the act of running the scanners, once you've actually dealt with all of your high and critical level issues, and then you've said, okay, we've got all these dealt with, at this point, we're gonna set it to now it's gonna break the build anytime a new higher critical level issue gets pulled in in the code base. Not in the dependencies, but in the code base itself. That way it's still within the power of your developers to resolve it right then. When you're talking about any type of DevOps pipeline, one of the biggest things is you don't want anything to stop the presses that the person who's got, who's got everything stopped can't deal with themselves. That's one of the absolute biggest things. If, you've got, if there's a new vulnerability that crops up and developers seeing the new vulnerability, they can either wait for you and wait for the whole process to go, well, yes, we actually need to deal with this, or they can just go fix it. And you want to give them the ability to just go fix it and then move on. Say, you resolve this. Here's, here's literally a link to what is wrong with this vulnerability and how you fix it. GitLab will, get, will give you that. With every one of those things, with every one of those vulnerabilities that it finds, you'll click on it, it'll describe it, it'll describe why it's a problem, how to fix it, and a lot of, a lot of them, especially the really common ones, will have a video explaining it, uh, which is great too. It's kind of a long answer, but it's a, it, it's a loaded question because you can't just ignore them, but you do have to decide uh, at what level and how much you're gonna bite off at a time. 
and uh, you know, and, and, and the most recent one, I just took on a 10-year-old code base that had never run a security scanner before. And, uh, and the team, you know, it was a team of about 12 guys. Uh, we turned it on. We ran the scanners. And I had one guy that was there who was very, very passionate about the security aspect of it. He took three days just to fix all of the high-end security and the, all of the high-end critical stuff without complaining about it, without arguing about why we did or did not have to resolve these things. Because usually they're pretty straightforward to resolve. That's the other thing that I always try to tell people. Don't look at the volume. Every one of these things, you literally have instructions on how to deal with every single thing here. This should not take you long to fix. It's a small error for the most part. And so if you can get them resolved quickly, move on. You'll spend, you will spend less time resolving it than you will talking about resolving it. <laughs> but. Yeah. Uh, obviously, a lot of this depends on the, the commit and then the work being done on the GitLab itself, but right. do they have any like integrations with like IDEs or anything like that? I mean, I know I've used some other like like sneak and stuff like that, like to actually integrate with ID and like check the code live. Uh, you have, have you seen any of that in there? Sort of. Uh, so GitLab itself has has ID integrations. Okay. They've got you know they've got their own uh, VS Code plugin as well as a bunch of other ones that'll show you build statuses and and project issues and everything like that right alongside it. The um, now they've just added all their AI stuff, which I haven't really had a chance to test out. But it's you know they've got their own flavor of of, of code completion and, and developer aid tools and all that. With the specific individual scanners, no. But uh, there is nothing at all stopping you from pulling them in and running them locally. Um, there's nothing stopping you from setting it as you know within your editor as a as a save hook to just go ahead and run breakman like right there in your in your ID every time you save to just have it check the file. Uh, I haven't done it before, but I would understand if somebody wanted to. With all of the scanners that are on there, every one of them is set up within a container that is configured to properly run the scanner. And so it'll pull down the container. So theirs are set to run in, the sh in a shared runner that will pull the Docker container that has the tool properly configured. It will aim it at your code and it will scan it so, you, so that you have no configuration to worry about. Anything else? This may this may fall under licensing or may not fall under set ops at all. Just set ops. Um, is there any type of copyright detection? Say a developer pushes a code block or commits a code block that may be considered proprietary information of another organization. Not that I know of. The only I mean the only thing that I do know of is that at least with the with the GitLab code completion tools, like their AI code completion tools, um, they warrant that it's trained on, it's not trained on anything that you have to worry about. Like I know Copilot's actually gotten into a lot of trouble for that and there's lawsuits pending for it because people have said, you know, it's, you trained it on our private code <laughs> just because it was on GitHub. Now, that's another way it differentiates, just so you know, <laughs> I was wondering, but, uh, but yeah. Sorry, it's not, not a great answer, but as far as I know, no. Yeah, I'm not even sure where you would where you could really start with that unless it was unless you had access to something to scan all the copyrighted code yourself. No, no one's gonna let their code just be scanned and held in a repo like that. So yeah. you could probably do like a stack overflow or something or something like that. Yeah. 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 Yeah.